heard a story recently, for real story, about a person who noticed a moving van in their neighborhood, so she quickly whipped up a fresh batch of banana bread, and she took some to the new family to warmly welcome them to the neighborhood, and met the homeowner and did all that. And the homeowner received the small gift of food, and then paused for one, two, three, four steamboats, and finally said, thank you so much for your hospitality, but this is a little embarrassing. We're actually moving out of the neighborhood. <laughs> and we've lived here for eight years. Friends, we live in a culture of isolation. Many people don't really know their neighbors. And many people are very, very lonely. We have tons of virtual friends in this culture on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. But so many people don't have real friends. Take the time to Google this phrase, loneliness epidemic Canada. I think you'll be amazed, surprised, perhaps even shocked at the article stories and academic studies that pop up by the scores. We live in a very relationally isolated culture. One such study suggests that one in five Canadians is lonely. By my math, that's about seven million people in our country. Another study would say that people ages 18 to 34 perceive themselves to be lonelier than people who are 55 and older. Interesting and curious stats on the world in which we live. And it's so sad because God God has created us to experience something so different. We've been created as relational beings. So that way back in the Garden of Eden, in a world we've never experienced, it was paradise world untainted by sin. In that world, Adam lived. He lived in paradise, and yet in that perfect environment, God would nevertheless say something is wrong here, and what was wrong was the fact that he was alone. So it tells us that we have been created by God, first of all, to be restored to relationship with God through faith in Jesus, and then to genuine, meaningful people connections in our lives. It's what each of us needs. It's what each of us needs to be is a genuine friend and to have genuine friends. God, in fact, works powerfully through friendships in our lives as we both have those kind of relationships and as we are those kind of people to build more and more of the strength of Jesus into us. With that in mind, and as we continue in our teaching series from the life of David... Open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 18. It's page 198 in the church Bibles. And from the wonderful friendship, the deep friendship that David shared with the son of King Saul, a guy by the name of Jonathan, let's pull some principles out of these verses that will help us to understand what genuine life-giving, spiritual friendship looks like. These are the kind of friends we need in our lives. These are the kind of friends that God calls us to be to other people. And the first thing that I want us to see to that end is this. Genuine friendship, true spiritual friendship that the Spirit of God uses to fill our sails with the wind of God, First of all, it's characterized by mutual mission. Mutual mission, verse 1. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. The backdrop, of course, to these verses is that incredible moment in the Valley of Elah where the kid David said, if no one else is willing to take on the giant, I'll do it. And he stepped into the valley... And in audacious faith in the living God, he brought the Philistine behemoth down. Now, Jonathan was serving in Saul's army. So he got to watch this happen live and in person. And it was so compelling to him. Jonathan watched David in his passion for God and in his love for his countrymen and for Israel step up And it so grabbed his heart because those were some of the very same things that were on Jonathan's heart. 
and the English Standard Version of that first verse puts it this way. In that moment, as Jonathan saw David do this, his heart or soul was knitted to the soul of David. Their friendship began and grew out of this sense of shared mission, shared purpose in life. Friends, we've been created to be on mission with Jesus as followers of Christ. We were made for mission. Being a follower of Jesus isn't just about being in the stands. We get to be on the playing field. As followers of Christ, being his hands, feet, and voice into the lives of others. When we think of the kind of people that would be our friends who would build the life of Christ into us, when we think of the kind of people God is calling us to be to others, we want to be people who live out those relationships in the context of being on mission with Jesus. In fact, if we're looking for friends, step out and serve in some new ways, some new capacity, the gospel of the Lord Jesus. As we come alongside others who share a similar heart's passion for being on mission with Jesus, it's amazing the significant friendships that grow out of that dynamic. We are living in a culture right now where we're just beginning to understand the impact that we can potentially have with the gospel on kids between the ages of 4 and 14. It's being called the 414 window in our nation and in our province. Students between the ages of 4 and 14 are more open to Jesus in their lives than they will ever be for the rest of their lives. And when the Spirit of God grabs them in there, He's got them for the balance of their time on planet Earth. I mean, serving in kids' ministry isn't the only way we can do this. There are so many ways to serve. But there would be something, for example, about being alongside Pastor Diane, Pastor Hilda, and some of the volunteers in kids' ministry just knowing that God is working through me to raise up a generation of faith that just grabs a heart. And when we serve alongside people with a similar heart's passion, it's amazing. How life-giving friendships grow to that connection. That's what happened for David and Jonathan. I would say this, and Grace and I were talking about this this past week. As we reflect over our lives in marriage together and in ministry, we have lifelong friendships that have come out of serving alongside others on mission with the Lord Jesus. It's a great place to be a friend, to make a friend. Here's the second thing then that characterizes the kind of life-giving friendship that God has created for us to experience and to pour into the life of another. It's marked by selfless sacrifice. Verse 1 again. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. Significant spiritual friendship is marked by mutual mission and by selfless sacrifice. So Jonathan literally and figuratively was the guy who would give you the shirt off his back. In that moment, he gave a bunch of things that were his things to David. Let's focus on just two of them. Jonathan gave to David his sword. In that era in Israel, steel was in short supply. So weapons were hard to come by. So for Jonathan to give David his sword was a significant personal sacrifice and a really strong statement about the level of relationship that Jonathan perceived that he had with his friend David. And then, Jonathan gave to David his robe. That was huge. Because who is Jonathan? He was the oldest child and the oldest son of the reigning King Saul. That meant, of course, that he was heir to the throne. He was next in line to be the leader of Israel, except for that moment in which he gave to David his robe. That was more than handing somebody your coat. That conveyed to David and to everybody who would have witnessed that moment that Jonathan acknowledged that God's choice for the next leader was David 
and he openly confessed that, David, you're going to be the king, and I will be in your corner and support you to that end. And he gave his robe as a strong symbol of that very reality. That was humble sacrifice in our people relationships. Sacrificing, serving. Those are the things that mark significant friendship that God uses to build his grace into the lives of people. Late night talk show host Stephen Colbert a few years ago delivered the commencement address at his alma mater, Northwestern University, and in part, this is what Stephen said. After I graduated, I moved to Chicago and did improv. Now, there are very few rules to improvisation, but one of the things I was taught early on is that you are not the most important person in the scene. Everybody else is. And if they're the most important people in the scene, you will naturally pay attention to them and serve them. But the good news is you're in the scene too. So hopefully to them, you're the most important person and they will serve you. No one is leading. You're all following the leader, serving the servant. I love that. Serving the servant. We could take that tag this day, and say, Spirit of the living God, in my marriage, in my people connections, with my kids, help me to live out the selfless sacrifice, the heart of Jesus, the humility that's reflected in that. Help me to be a servant first. I mean, we could own that and call it a day and go home. Our relationships will be powerfully impacted by the grace of God as we increasingly choose in dependence upon the Spirit to live towards other people with a servant, sacrificial spirit. That's the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ towards us. And friendship that's powerful, that's meaningful, that the Spirit of God works through to build His strength into us. Friendship that's marked by selfless sacrifice. We need those friends in our lives. We need to be to others those kind of people. This is who God is calling us to be. Here's a third characteristic of genuine friendship. It's this. It's loyal love. Look at verse 3. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. In his heart, in that moment, I believe before his God, Jonathan arrived at a significant moment and he made a promise that I'm going to be in that guy's corner. From this day forward, I am going to have his back and I am going to be his cheerleader. In his book on the life of David, J.S. Park says that there was evidently a moment in Jonathan's life where he very volitionally chose that he would not be jealous of David, but that he would be jealous for him. And he purposed to be in David's corner. That kind of loyalty, that kind of love, that is foundational stuff for a meaningful, life-giving friendship. I had a running buddy for many, many years, and we were both a little bit competitive, so we pushed each other. It was great. Together we've run several different races over the years. And on one occasion, we were running a race... And it was both a half marathon and a marathon. And at some point, the two choruses intermingled, and it was a little confusing. And I managed to keep going the right way. My friend was a little bit behind me. He came to the same intersection and made a mistake. He went with the half marathon track. That meant that he probably ran two and a half or three extra kilometers before he got back on the road. That also meant that for Larry, his chance of having a good time was officially over. We met at the finish line. I, for me, as a plotter, I had a good day on that race on that day. But when I heard what happened to him and how it went so badly, I mean, I was so disappointed for him. And for about five seconds, Larry acknowledged the disappointment and the frustration of taking the wrong turn on the course, and it was poorly marked. But after that, it was all about for him celebrating my day and affirming me and bragging on me, and I have never forgotten the humility and the loyalty of a friend in that moment. And I've said to myself, if that situation had been reversed, 
Would I have been, could I have been the same guy? I'm really not sure. I would hope so. But I'm telling you, a real friend is loyal. They're loyal with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they've got your back, and they cheer you on. And those are the same people that we're called to be to others. By the way, in that same book on the life of King David, J.S. Park says, your friend, your loyal friend, that also means that they will be in your corner certainly to affirm you and cheerlead you, but they will also be in your corner to the extent that they will speak the truth and love in your life when it's needful. In other words, call you out, offer you a word of challenge, ask the hard question when it needs to be asked. And the author goes on to say that if it's been a long time since we've actually had someone tell us that we're wrong, we may not have any real friends in our lives. I've chewed on that one this week. That's quite a challenging statement. But I think there's something there. Real friends are loyal. They love us with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's who God calls us to be to others. Fourthly, genuine, life-giving spiritual friendship is marked by tenacious transparency. It has got to be tenacious Because in terms of being transparent, authentic, bearing my soul, I have to press hard into that. Because I don't know about you, but for me it's a challenge. It doesn't necessarily come easily. But as we have that person or person in our lives, as we are this to someone else, where we are open and honest, that's incredibly life-giving in the mercy of God. Two times in the verses that we just read, The Word of God says that Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. First in verse 1, and then again in verse 3. And the phrase, Jonathan loved David as he loved himself, is descriptive of the incredible friendship of openness and transparency that those two guys shared. Skip ahead for a moment to chapter 20 and verse 1. There we read, then David fled from Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to kill me? If you know a little bit of the story here, not long after David gets anointed the next king of Israel, he finds himself running for his life as King Saul, in a rage, marshals the forces of Israel to hunt David down and take him out. So here is David in this verse now running for his life. And he has an encounter with his friend Jonathan. And does he hold back? Not one bit. He says, Jonathan, what is wrong with your dad? Why is he trying to kill me? Jonathan could easily have received those words very defensively. Worse yet, Jonathan could have received those words as a profound offense. After all, David was talking about his dad. As the verses that follow go on to describe, while it was evident in that moment that Jonathan didn't really get where David was coming from, nor did he necessarily agree with him right then and there, but he nevertheless listened. It's clear that in their relationship and their friendship, there was a level of transparency about it that gave each party the freedom to vent their spleen. And on this moment, David totally did that. And Jonathan didn't offer any trite free advice. He didn't offer any judgmental retort. What he did was listen. The kind of friends that God is calling us to be in the lives of others, the kind of friends that God uses to build his life into us would be this kind of a friendship. It's marked by an openness, by an honesty, where we listen first. Skip ahead to verse 41 of the same chapter. After the boys had gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together, but David wept the most. So again, uh, we have this moment between these two friends where there's an 
incredible expression of emotional transparency. Now, some have taken a verse like that in the friendship of Jonathan and David, and they've tried to make a homosexual relationship out of it. And the reality is there's nothing whatsoever in the text that would support that kind of an inference at all. In fact, such an assertion, at a minimum, would demonstrate quite an ignorance of Eastern culture. In Eastern culture to the present... A man will walk with another man hand in hand, and that's just an expression of friendship. They'll even give each other a kiss on the cheek. If you were to visit North Africa today or the Middle East and greet someone, you could get a kiss on the cheek because it's just culturally normal. What did the Apostle Paul write on more than one occasion to the early churches? Greet one another with a holy kiss. What do you think, Aaron, next Sunday? Let's go all in. Let's go for the holy kiss. Amen? I mean, that would be exceedingly awkward. That's not what we do in our culture. But in parts of the world, it is what they do. And it was that way in Paul's day. And it was that way in David's world. So what we've got going on here is a God-honoring friendship between two men who have a heart for their king, the king of Israel, Yahweh. And a love for their country. And God brought them together in a depth of friendship that was marked by this incredible transparency. Where they both spoke their minds. And openly shared the emotion that was on their hearts. That is the kind of friendship. That's the kind of depth of relationship that our God has created for us to experience with other people. Amen? The flip side, however, is expressed in a writing by a Christian author. His name is Patrick Morley. And he writes that most men could think of six individuals to invite to their funeral to be pallbearers. But most people don't have someone that they could call to at two in the morning and pour out their hearts. If that's even close to true, that's incredibly tragic. That so many people could identify six individuals who would come to their funeral and carry their box to the cemetery, but those same people don't really have a person in their lives that in the middle of the night, they could just pour out their hearts and know they had an empathetic and listening ear. Friends, our world needs people like that. Right now, the Spirit of God is placing on our hearts and minds people that we know need someone like that. Now, be Jonathan to them. Be that person. A listening ear. An empathetic heart. Not offering simplistic solutions or trite answers or worse yet, judgment. Just listening and offering prayers. Words of encouragement. And that brings us to the last thing then that characterizes from our text this morning the kind of spiritual friendship we've been created for, which the Spirit of God uses to build life into us, and it is this. It's endless encouragement, endless encouragement. Skip ahead one page to the right to chapter 23 and verses 15 and 16. David continues to run for his life, and we read this in verse 15. While David was at Horish in the desert of Ziph, he learned that Saul had come out to take his life. So, David's out there hiding in the desert, and Saul and his soldiers, they're somewhere in the vicinity. We can only begin to imagine how intense and fearful this must have been for David. Verse 16, And Saul's son Jonathan went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. I love that phrase. Jonathan helped David find strength in God. In other words, at some significant personal risk, Jonathan, a soldier in Saul's army, took a little detour, went out of his way to find David, and he brought specific encouragement to David in the name of the living God in that moment. Real friends, bring to their other friends endless words of encouragement. 
The great statesman, leader of America, our friends to the South during the dark days of the Civil War was, of course, President Abraham Lincoln. He was tragically assassinated on April 14, 1865. Historians have long mused over the items that were found on Lincoln's person in his pockets after that incredibly sad day when his life was taken from him. And in his pockets, among other things, were, for example, uh, two pairs of reading glasses, a wallet with a $5 Confederate note in it, uh, two jackknives, a watch fob, and a handful of newspaper articles that were favorable to the president and to his policies at the time. So there was the great leader of America during the Civil War taking with him, apparently, everywhere that he went, some words of positivity and encouragement. Tells me that it doesn't matter who we are. Whether it's ordinary me or a great leader of the world, everybody needs lots of encouragement. In our people relationships, let's be those people. Amen? There's plenty of negativity in our world. What about... If the people of God, the followers of the Lord Jesus, and following after Christ, who is the most joyful person on the planet, just won on a full-on affirmation offensive in our relationships. We are here to speak thoughtful words of life, encouragement, joy, and hope into the lives of others. That is the mark of a friend through whom God does an incredible work in the life of another. Now, when I was growing up, my mom and dad said to me often, if you want a friend, be a friend. A little bit challenging for me. I'm more introverted by nature, but there's a truism there. If you want a friend, be a friend. Let's each of us purpose before the Lord God this morning, this week, to be Jonathan to somebody. To come alongside someone in serving on mission with Jesus. To sacrifice humbly and to bless them in some way. In loyalty. In openness and transparency. But the fact that we're just in the journey too and we haven't got it all figured out but we're trusting in God day by day as well just like everybody else. And then also with lots of encouragement. As we choose to be those kind of friends in the life of somebody, make no mistake, the Spirit of God will work through us mightily to build the strength of Jesus into their lives. And I would also then say this. Before the Lord our God, as we choose to be those kind of friends, that's authentic spiritual friendship in the life of another, I think our God's going to send some of those kind of friends into our lives as well. Let's pray. Father God, we acknowledge the truth of your word that you've created us for relationship. We are relational beings. And I pray that you'd grant us the grace, each of us here this morning, very specifically, very intentionally in the week to come, to be to somebody else that we have a relationship with, someone to whom we're connected. These things that characterize genuine friendship, these things which were reflected in the friendship of David and Jonathan. And then, Father God, If one in five Canadians are lonely, there's some lonely people here this morning. Statistically speaking, there are some people here this morning that are lonely. I pray, Jesus, that you'd surround them with your presence and your love. And I ask in your mercy, you, our creator, knowing our need for friendship and relationship in our lives, that you'd send to them the right person. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.